quality. I'm going to start with the worst mistake anyone could possibly make when exporting their animation. Leaving animation helpers in. Sometimes people just forget, but most of the time people don't even know that there are separate models, even though all they needed to do was scroll down a few inches and read the big red boxes in the description. The thing that's even more surprising is the people who scroll right past them to leave a comment asking for help. For those who still don't know what an animation helper is, an animation helper is a low-poly version of a model created for performance reasons. It makes it possible to have a long session with multiple models and audio without crashing SFM. After all your animation is finished, you delete any audio you might have had and copy-paste the animation helper samples onto the normal or high-poly model. Before pasting the samples, you must apply any rigs and scaling that the original animation helper might have had. Now, I'm going to switch out the animation helper in my short. It already looks infinitely better. This brings us to our second biggest problem, progressive refinement. First of all, anti-aliasing. There is literally zero reason to turn this off unless you really know what you're doing. Anti-aliasing smooths out the edges of pixels by blending the colors. It's best to always leave this on. Second of all, samples. Depth of field samples are incredibly important to making your renders look realistic and high quality. Depth of field samples smooth out your ambient occlusion, radius lights, volumetric lights, and obviously your aperture. Finally, motion blur samples smooth out your motion blur. However, adding more samples drastically adds to your rendering time. I have a powerful computer and I am willing to wait for quality, so I use the max amount of samples whenever I can. A lot of people have far less powerful computers and sometimes even laptops. To the people with wimpy computers, I recommend using 128 depth of field and 64 motion blur samples. It will still take a long time to render depending on your computer, but depending on the shot, the difference can be hours. It is mostly impossible to tell 128 depth of field and 64 motion blur samples from the max amount if the blur isn't that intense. SFM can't use 256 samples if the shutter speed is less than 0.013 can't use 128 samples if the shutter speed is less than 0.007, and can't use 64 samples if the shutter speed is less than 0.004. I have found that 64 samples looks great, and I wouldn't ever recommend using below 0.004 shutter speed anyway. Now that the two biggest problems are out of the way, I'll be talking about smaller nitpicks, and some things that are just personal preference. The first one is rendering options. Personally, I render image sequences in the Targa format. Targas are uncompressed, but I doubt there is a noticeable difference in quality between TGAs and PNGs. If you are looking for speed, Targas are the quickest. I tested rendering times on the first shot of my prototype collab part. PNGs are the slowest, and AVIs are in the middle. I don't have quick time, so I couldn't test MP4, but from my experience back when I rendered MP4s on my old computer, they have poor compression, take longer to render, and look worse. I would apply compression and convert video in post instead of rendering mp4s. Now I want to talk about motion blur. Motion blur is a stylistic choice and there isn't a right or wrong, but I'm going to give you my opinion. I think motion blur is essential at around 30 fps. You can get away without using motion blur at 60 fps, but I would still use it anyway. If you have no motion blur at 24 or 30 fps, your animation will look really unnatural and jittery. Maybe you can make it work if you're going for a gritty feel, but it makes your animation look very unrealistic. However, if you're going to use motion blur, please lower your shutter speed. Motion blur at 0.021 shutter speed looks horrible. It is impossible to see anything. It looks gross. I recommend using anywhere around 0.005 and 0.010 shutter speed. Next is Bloom. SFM Bloom sucks. If you really don't have a better option, use it lightly. If you do, almost anything is better than SFM. While there is actually a Bloom width option, it makes the Bloom square. You'd have to be very creative to make this work. For volumetric lights, samples are the most important thing. However, if you don't want to use 1024 samples, but don't want your light to look bladed, 
you should move the max distance slider as low as you can without cutting off your light. If you want to avoid the pixelated look when shadow filter size is at zero, you should add a little bit of radius to your light. You could try sliding the shadow filter size up only a little bit, but radius is much better. Finally, SFM can only normally render video up to 720p. If you want to render in 1080p, you have to put it in the launch options. Here is a before and after comparison. Quality! That is all I have for quality in SFM, at least for now. All of the things I talked about require zero skill, and besides rendering time, five minutes. The second part of my tutorial will be on random tips with SFM, and not as high quality as the first part of the video. Welcome to the tips portion of this video. The first tip I want to show you is engine synced to fixed FPS. This is a really helpful setting when you have a session that runs extra slowly. This setting will force SFM to display every frame, even if it won't be in real time. Now I want to talk about Uber Lights. I actually have a lot to say about Uber Lights. The first thing you need to do is you need to show the light you want in the element viewer and enable Uber Lights. I also like to turn on the light frustrum so you can see exactly what's happening with your Uber Light. So an Uber light just kind of gives you more control over the light. So this inner circle, all the light is even, I think. Between the inner and outer circle, that's where the light starts to fall off. It's a gradient of intensity. So you have settings for that right here. So you have basic width, you have basic height, and these move both. But edge width and edge height basically are just expanding the gradient. If you turn both the edge width and edge height sliders to zero, you get a really cool effect. Unfortunately, you have to turn off depth of field in order to see it. Another aspect of Uber Lights is their shape. By default, Uber Lights aren't perfect circles. If you want your light to be more circular or square, you have to adjust the roundness setting in the element viewer. While you still have your light in the element viewer, you can adjust the ambient occlusion settings for it. You can turn off AO entirely for the light, or use a decimal value. This tip has to do with the graph editor. I'll be going over these three buttons, however, I've not been able to figure out what the middle button does. It says it automatically frames curves, but it does not seem to make a difference on or off. Normalized curve display is simple and works well. When it is enabled, it will stack and scale all your samples in a convenient way. Offset mode makes new keyframes offset your existing samples rather than overwriting them. Basically, it works like the motion editor. This tip will affect the viewport. When you right click in the viewport, you will find the display flyout menu. This menu allows you to turn viewport overlays on or off. The only one of these options that is on by default is show camera frustrum. This option allows you to see the dimensions, focal distance, Z near, and Z far of your camera. Show focal plane shows the focal plane of your camera constantly, rather than only when the slider is being manipulated. Show transform labels displays the name of bones on a model constantly instead of only one hovered over. Show shot ID overlay duplicates the information on top of the viewport to inside it. Finally, Show View Targets makes models with an eye view target display the position of the view target. This tip will allow you to turn on and off wireframe inside the viewport. In the console, you need to type mat wireframe, one for on and zero for off. Models are blue and the map is red. My final tip is on particles. Unfortunately, particles have enough to them to require a separate video, so I will be going over the very basics. I recommend experimenting with particles yourself, since that's how I learned to use them. Warning, you have to be good at troubleshooting. You will not easily find your answer online, and will most likely have to solve it yourself. I had to record all my settings on a notepad and experiment until I found my answer.
If a particle is messing up, turning off motion blur will probably solve it, even though this is not the source of the problem. If your particles are flying out of its bounds, turn off Oscillate Vector. If your particles are jittering, use a form of movement other than random force. These are the problems I've run into, but you will have different ones. You can find all these settings in the Particle System Editor. First, you need to instance your particle system. Then, view the part you want to edit in the Particle System Editor. The viewport works like the model viewer, and the rest is similar to the element viewer. I will be going over Movement Basic, Color Random, Lifetime Random, Position Within Sphere Random, Radius Random, Alpha Random, and Emit Continuously. The only setting I use that applies to all properties is Operator Enabled. This setting turns the property on and off. For Movement Basic, gravity decides which direction the particles will gravitate to, and drag gives them more resistance. For color random, you set both colors, and each particle will be a random color in between. For lifetime random, you need to set your minimum and maximum lifetime in seconds. For position within sphere random, you have minimum and maximum properties for how far or close a particle can spawn to the control point. Distance bias and distance bias absolute value are a bit harder to explain, but I'll do my best. Distance bias makes the spawning position of particles disproportionate. For example, 001 would spawn particles only at the top of the sphere. Distance bias absolute value is not affected by a value being either negative or positive, obviously because of absolute value. The property forces particles to spawn on only one half of an axis. For example, 001 would only spawn particles in the top half of the sphere. Position within Sphere Random also has movement options for inside the sphere and overall. For Radius Random, you set the minimum and maximum radius, and a particle will be a random size within the boundaries. Alpha Random is just like Radius and Color Random, but with alpha or transparency. For Emit Continuously, your emission rate sets the amount of particles you want to be emitted per second. An emission duration sets how long you want the entire emission to last. An emission duration of zero means particles will be replaced as they die. That is all I have for quality and other tips in SFM. I made this tutorial as a special for 10,000 subscribers, but it is a weird milestone since I went from 42 to 13,000 in a few weeks. Regardless, thank you everyone. I hope you found this tutorial helpful.